So thank you all for joining us today. This is our last brown bag uh, for the fall 2023 semester. And we are excited to have Michael with us. I reached out to Michael because he is doing some fun things or at least talking about a lot of fun things regarding gaming theory. Um, for those that don't know, gaming theory is essentially getting students or learners uh, to play with the way that they are interacting with content or interacting with skills. And it's really just a, another extension of active learning, in my opinion. Uh, Michael might differ on that thought. Um, but it kind of creates and builds on the concept of fun. Um, so without further ado, I am going to let Michael sort of introduce himself, talk about where he's at today, and then dive into gaming theory. So thank you all for joining us. All right. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how much theory I'll get into, although I'll touch on a little bit of it. But I want to provide some specific uh, illustrations or examples of how you can do some of these things, as well as some resources that you'll be able to to take after uh, with you. And uh, but knowing that we've got a small group here, what I always try to do up front is um, find out what brought you here in the first place. Um, so uh, I'll start with that question and I'll allow you to just drop it in the chat while I do a little introduction of myself um, because I've got some slides prepared, but I'm also happy to just freewheel it with, you know, a, a browser and, and and show you some stuff or just talk through some things, pull resources off of my bookshelf and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, in the chat, uh, if for the folks that I guess the six or seven folks that are in the room, um, you know, you've taken an hour out of your time today. You could have just watched the recording, but you made a specific effort to be here at a given times, and that takes some coordination these days. Um, so what was it that actually brought you here today? Um, so while you're typing that in the chat, uh, so I'm Mike Barber. I'm a uh, professor of instructional design and the director of faculty development for the College of Education and Health Sciences over in Toro University, California. Uh, so uh, we're located over in Vallejo. I'm actually up here in Vacaville, which is about, I guess, 45 minutes north. Uh, if you've been over in the Bay Area, I'm halfway between Sacramento and San Francisco. Um, and um, best known because Jelly Belly and the outlets, the closest outlets to San Francisco are located here. So that's sort of what we're kind of known for. Um, and I see some folks are um, dropping a few things in the chat. Uh, okay, so I think I've got some slides that'll deal with some of this. So maybe I'll do a little bit of the formal presentation first, and then we can um, break and just chat and go through with some more specific questions as you guys um, get there. So let's see. Alrighty. Um, oh, I also forgot to mention I'm in charge of micro credentials for the system as well, um, which is actually a big part of my job these days. So, um, and I think that's probably uh, where Patricia uh, first uh, caught wind of me. So, um, first thing I want to ask is when I think of game, when I, I mention the term gaming, what are some of the things that um, come to mind for you guys? And you can grab them in the mic or you can drop them in the chat. It's up to you. I'll go get things started. For me, Michael, it's um, uh, fun. It's really the what I'm trying to do with, with gaming theory is, is create a different atmosphere in the classroom and break up um, what they're currently doing and get them to think about it differently. Okay. Other folks, what do you think of when you think of gaming? And it can be gaming in general, not necessarily just gaming in the classroom. Um, I think of creativity. And when you apply it to the classroom, it's creativity to help students learn. I'm also, uh, and as Anne mentioned, definitely a new idea for me. 
in terms of introducing it into the classroom. And I'm also wondering whether there are any studies that uh, correlate use of gaming in the classroom with uh, outcomes of learning uh, it, in addition to engagement. In other words, it may engage the students more, um, but does it, and I hope it does, increase their learning outcomes. Any others? Just a little trick that, uh, uh, since I am in charge of faculty development here that I always use, um, if you don't have one of these little, um, and they come in all sorts of things, but it's a little thing for you to sort of rest your phone on, get one of them and carry them with you. The reason I say that is because when we're presenting in the classroom or online, one of the things we always hear about is wait time. And if you actually look at the research around wait time, the average university instructor, the average college level instructor will wait approximately seven seconds for a response from the students when they throw out a question. Um, research suggests that they actually need about 23 to form a, a coherent thought response or question for you. Um, so we're actually only giving them about a third of the time in which they need to have it. Um, one of the ways in which you can force yourself to give them extra time is to just have the timer going on your thing. And I just start it whenever I start a presentation or start a class so that my stopwatch is always just going on my phone. And I just put it on the little cradle here and just stick it right in front of me. So that way, whenever I ask a question of the group, I can always just look to see what it's at and then make sure I give at least 25 seconds for folks to form that coherent thought um, because that's what the average student is going to take. Um, so completely nothing about gaming, but always a little trick that I use myself that I always like to pass on to folks because it's quite handy. It's something you can just stick either on the, the podium or the lectern up front because most of us are using um, you know, something that's going to drive our slides or what have you anyway, if we're not doing it online. Um, so when I do this, and I do it a lot more, I'll be honest with you, in a K-12 audience than I do in a higher ed audience. But I think the, the, the basic premise applies uh, across the board, because when you think about gaming, you know, a lot of people will think about something like this. Others will, you know, go really old school and think about something like this. Um, you know, and, and these are both fine. These are both, you know, established kinds of games that have rules. And if I were to ask you about either of these, because they're both popular enough, you'd be able to tell me sort of, you know, what the purpose of the game is and, and how you play it. And, you know, you probably even have at least for Monopoly some strategy that you use in terms of, you know, trying to win the game itself. But games can actually be quite sort of open ended. So, um, you know, this little girl down here, for example, is playing the lava game. And if you're not familiar with the lava game, basically it's that the floor is lava and that um, you have to jump around from thing to thing so that you don't fall into the lava. Um, in fact, as best I can tell, looking at, at, you know, Googling to try to find out what the origins of this game are, this was actually a game that was created by kids themselves that then a... Um, company decided that they were going to try to monetize. So they actually have these little patches now that you can put on the floor in between the various, you know, in, what it was pieces of furniture. I was trying to come up with the, the, the right word there. Pieces of furniture in your household that the kids can jump from place to place. Um, a lot of folks, particularly at the K-12 level, although I tried to get a, a more adult friendly version here, um, and, uh, you know, when I say gaming, think of this, although in all honesty, if you're, that was sort of your first thought, this is actually a more accurate representation of it. Um, because when you look at online gaming right now, adult females actually make up the largest single group of, when they say adult, they mean over 18, um, you know, females over 18 actually make up the largest single group of, of online gamers at the moment. Uh, which I always find interesting because a lot of people, when they associate gaming and gaming theory and why we should do games, automatically think of, you know, that, well, more of this image than you would this image. Um, 
So one of the reasons why we, we think about gaming or we talk about gaming when it comes to learning is because there's a lot of overlap between the purposes and the process that you would have uh, between the the two aspects of it. Um, you know, and here's just a, actually, I, I stole this from the folks at, I think it was York University um, or it might've been Queens, one of the Ontario based ones anyway, because I'm a Canadian um, by birth. And I guess I'm Canadian just in general, because um, I'm not anything else yet. I've never taken, you know, my American citizenship or anything like that. So I guess I'm just a Canadian. Um, so I always like to steal the, the examples that I use from my Canadian colleagues. Um, but this one here sort of goes across and, and looks at how you line up some of the things that we normally do in education with what normally happens in a game. Um, and because there's such a good alignment for it, it makes it easy to accomplish a lot of these things, even if you're not necessarily technically savvy and able to do a lot of the stuff in, in the game. And and it's something that everyone can play with. So, you know, I was only um, last week, was it last week, week before, in the past week and a half, basically, uh, we had our college leadership retreat. And one of the first things that the dean had us do as a team building activity was basically we got in groups of two and she had us complete these jigsaw puzzles um, and put us in, uh, you know, teams that were competing against each other to figure out who could finish them first or second or third. And you'd be amazed at, you know, how I mean, I, I don't mind saying I'm, I'm 50 years old and, and, you know, she gave us puzzles that were, you know, for ages three and up. And you'd be amazed at how, you know, competitive people who are, you know, in their 50s and 60s and uh, become automatically when you put a game in front of them, regardless of the nature of that game. And and I, I like the fact that it was just, you know, these four puzzles that were for ages three and up that made us so competitive as we were going through. Um, so. As we think about this, one of the things that, you know, I want to sort of assuage folks of um, and one of the basic premises that you sort of need to have when you think about um, gaming, particularly gaming when it comes to assessment and our students, um, while as university faculty, we hold our assessment near and dear, and we think that our assessment is incredibly important, and I'm not suggesting that it's it's not, um, but the precision in which we are able to assess our students and what they actually know, um, there's a great mismatch between how well we think our assessment is and how well it actually is. Um, you know, and, and one of the things I always think about when I think about my own assessment is I remember um, having a student who, when I think it was my second or third year uh, of teaching when I was at Wayne State University, who was, I think, like 0.8 away from, you know, getting a, a B as opposed to a B minus. Um, you know, so he had a B minus based on the thing, but if I were to bump him up another 0.8, he would have had a B. And for some reason, I thought that at the time that, you know, there was something wrong with that. You know, I didn't think he had earned a B. Um, never once dawned on me the fact that, you know, there was no way in the world that my assessment was precise enough and accurate enough to be able to measure the difference between, you know, whether he got that extra 0.8 or not. And, um, you know, the fact that I was arguing with him about that, um, well, to be perfectly honest with you, was petty on my part. Um, you know, and I guess with age and wisdom comes that idea. But the reason I always mention this when I talk about gaming is the fact that, um, you know, the assessments that we put through are never going to be at a level that it has the accuracy that some of these things would make a difference for. In fact, it's one of the reasons why you see so many folks in higher education now moving away from grades altogether and moving more towards a pass-fail competency type thing. You, you know, illustrate that you either can do it or you can't do it. Um, and, you know, that's sort of the way the world works anyway. Um, you know, we all work in academia, um, other than the fact that they look for the verification that we had our degree. Uh, I don't know how many jobs I've ever applied to that have actually asked me for my transcript. 
and that have cared that I only got an 87 instead of an 89 in some second year freshman or, you know, some second year class that I did as a freshman back in 1993 or four, somewhere around there anyway. Um, you know, so when you look at gaming and, you know, you, you have to sort of step back from grading, um, and it, that's important because, you know, that's one of the reasons why games become uh, engaging for our students, um, you know, not just game based learning, but games in general. You know, the reason why, you know, those puzzles became so engaging to a bunch of college leaders, you know, it wasn't because it was a high level of of of. Uh, knowledge that we were gaining from it. We weren't gaining any knowledge from it. Um, we were gaining some team building skills from it, sure. Um, but the reality was it was just something that, you know, we needed to come up with a product. We needed to generate something. Um, you know, so one of the things that we want to look at as we look at game-based learning is the difference between game-based learning and gamification. Um, while we can do both of these in our classrooms, um, gamification is easier to do, I would suggest, than actually game-based learning. Uh, so game-based learning is where you're actually going to turn full learning activities or maybe even your entire course into a simulation or game style, uh, whereas gamification is just using some of the aspects of gaming that might encourage students or motivate students or engage students um into your course um, and some of these things we kind of do anyway and that's why education is so good for this because we're kind of already set up for things like this um, if you look at things like point systems and leaderboards um, as the first two examples they use in the gamification aspect you know well we have point systems um, you know they're called grades we you know um, while we don't tend to make leader you know our, our grading book public um depending on how you've got your canvas set up or what information you share with your students. In most cases, the system is defaulted to tell them, you know, what the maximum grade was, what the minimum grade was, what the average grade was. So they can usually get a sense as to, you know, where they are in terms of the curve for that particular assignment um, as they're looking at it, which is kind of like a de facto leaderboard. Um, so, when you're looking at um, this as a topic and, and a couple of resources that I want to point out. Um, so if you're not familiar with Jim G, it's actually, he's actually, a, uh, I think he's at Arizona now. He was at Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, when he did most of this work. Um, but the first thing that he did was this book called uh, What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy, because he's actually a literacy faculty member. Um, and this is quite some time ago that he published this uh, back in 2003. Um, but one of the things he had in there was he includes 36 principles of learning that video games and simulations naturally embed into their uh, product. And I've just pulled out a couple. Um, well, I guess I've pulled out seven, eight, eight. Um, that were in there. Actually, they're ones I could find that I could copy and paste off online, to be honest with you, um, over three different articles of folks that were coding these different 36 simulations because uh, I didn't want to spend the time typing out all 36 of them and what they meant. Um, and uh, But if you think about, you know, those types of video games and, you know, some of the things that they do and they do very well, um, they make you practice the things that you'll need to be able to do to level up or to accomplish whatever the main task is in the game. Um, I always think about, you know, Super Mario because that's the the one that, you know, has been around, I think, one of the longest things. And, um, you know, all of those little things that you've got to bounce around and, you know, you've got to jump over the rings of fire and pick up the turtles and throw them and all that kind of stuff. All of that is in practice for fighting that bad guy at the end that allows you then get the princess, even the ability to jump. Uh, certain distances and to reach certain heights is part of what you need to do off of that big block of stuff at the end when you grab the flagpole and the higher you get on the flagpole, the more points you get. Um, you know, those are all aspects of things that you have to practice along the way in order to be able to accomplish the game. Um, one of the things that they do very well in there is they'll have things in there and more sophisticated games have built AI that will give them at specific times. So if you go back to the original sort of Nintendo games, um, the ones that I would have played as a kid, 
the mushroom that made you grow from being this big to this big was always in the exact same spot. Um, the more sophisticated games now with the AI that they've built in, they'll put those things in in different locations and they will appear when the player needs or information mm -hmm. at random times or preset times. I'm providing it to you at the exact moment in which it's going to be useful to you. Um, you know, the, um, many of these games, and for that matter, many of the best learning is based upon sort of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Um, and if you haven't read any of his work, um, most of it was translated into English in the late sixties and early seventies. Um, and, um, it's worthwhile finding a good summary article of it. Um, the zone of proximal development basically posits the fact that, um, so Vygotsky is a uh, constructivist, a social constructivist to be exact. And he believes that learning happens when the learner interacts with a more knowledgeable other. Now, the more knowledgeable other might be a teacher or instructor. It could be a fellow student. It could be the textbook. It could be content that you've created and put into, um, into Canvas for them. And, um, but, you know, it's a social interaction that happens where the learner has to engage with um, somebody or something, uh, usually somebody. And the learner will continue to learn as long as they're in the zone of proximal development, which for Vygotsky was that area where the knowledge is just out of their reach. So it's not such a leap that they become unmotivated and, you know, oh, I can't figure this out and give up. You know, it's always just a little bit beyond what their current skill is, which requires them to have that interaction with the more knowledgeable other to gain that little bit of, of whatever it is that they need to be able to figure out what that next step is. Um, and video games are are wonderful for, for doing that kind of thing. Um, really, sort of any type of, of game or skill is, is based on, on that type of aspect of it. So... Um, if you are really interested in this, G's book is good. The original one, I would still recommend. He has done some others that are um, a little more updated. Um, so he did have a revised and updated edition of the What Video Games Have to Teach Me About Learning, uh, which he put out, I think, about eight years after the original one. Six years after the original one. Um they did a special um, conference at um, the University of Madison, Wisconsin, slightly or shortly after he published this original book. And all of the presenters were invited folks that were um, talking about this. So he edited a book called Good Video Games Equals Good Learning, uh, which came out from that conference. And it's basically just a bunch of essays from um, the folks that were presenting there. Uh, it's not bad. Um, it's, uh, well, it, it is, you know, 15, 18 years old. Uh, so the references are, are a bit dated, but the ideas are, are are fairly sound in there. And the thing I like about it compared to the other ones is G was a literacy uh, professor. So many of his examples are from English language arts, whereas this edited volume is a little bit uh, broader in terms of the examples that he uses in there. Um, so getting into a little bit of what you were asking about in terms of, you know, the, the why and, and what one of the, what the research tells us a little bit about this. Um, so the three basic reasons that you see given all the time, and there's usually, um, you know, if you were to go and search, you know, why gamify your course on Google right now, you'd find folks that have three things, four things, eight things, seven reasons, you know, whatever. Um, these are the four that you see most commonly um, happening are uh, most commonly included in any of those lists, um, you know, and, and I won't go in and read all of this and I'll share my side slides with Patricia so she can send them out uh, so you can have um, these in your um, in your collection of materials that you have along with the recording. Um, but as I mentioned before, the, the biggest reason I think to do it is because a lot of what you're doing is already inherently game-like anyway. So it's just using some of that language and maybe tweaking some of the things that you're doing um, to uh, allow for that to happen. 
Um, so easy ways to do it. Um, putting it into your grading system is obviously the, the easiest way. Um, particularly, and, and the most common way we see people doing this is by creating a bunch of badges or a bunch of things that you have to get. And if you get a certain number of these, you get a badge. Um, Points-based reward systems. Um, the most common way I see this being implemented, uh, instead of assuming that students are starting at 100%, and then you know they're based upon how they do on the assessments are going down with that. Uh, most of those point-based reward systems, students start with zero in the class. And the way in which we set up our grading system, instead of having things that are worth, you know, we've got 10 quizzes in the class that are worth 30% of the course, um, setting it up so that each quiz is worth so many points. And depending upon, you know, if you say, um, well, I'll just be trite with it and make my math easy because I was a social studies teacher. Um, you know, the first quiz is worth 10 points. And if you get 75 on it, that you get 7.5 points on it. And you just keep adding those points throughout the semester. Um, and by the end of the semester, the student has a score of 420 points out of a possible of 450. And, and you know, if you want to translate that into a particular grade, that's fine. Um, you know, if you want to just have a pass fail thing, you just have a level that they go on. Um, this idea of promoting quests um, and quests is a very game type word. Basically, it's just having them complete specific tasks that you need them. Usually multi-step tasks. Um, in the K-12 environment, you see a lot of people using web quests, uh, which I think are something we could use a lot more in, in higher education. Uh, web quests are basically, it, it's a quest. Um, you know, it is, you give the students a specific task, you give them a set of resources that you want them to use to complete that task. Um, in many cases, you've set them up in teams where each member of the team has a specific set of uh, responsibilities that they have within the team. And then there's a very defined product that they have to create in order to illustrate that they've completed the task. And that task can be, or that product can be graded using a, a fairly standard rubric. Um, you know, curriculum uh, webs are, are, are similar type things, although a little bit more uh, open-ended in nature. Um, one that, that I put on the list because it's often on the list, although I'm not ent entirely sure um, how useful it is with it. This is the fourth one there, that idea of creating competition. Um, I think a lot of it depends upon what the competition is about, um, you know, or, or the stakes behind the competition. Um, you know, if it's a, a competition like, you know, what we had at the environment where knowing what you're, you know, at the retreat, sorry, knowing what the puzzle looked like and actually completing the puzzle wasn't the important part of the task. The important part of the task was, you know, getting folks to work together, um, then creating that sort of competition where, you know, they, she basically had, um, you know, well, we got different varying levels of chocolate reward based upon where you finished in, in the one through four in that particular group. Um, and usually referred to the size of, of the chocolate bar that, that was a, associated with it. Um, oops, there I am right there. Uh, so, you know, that kind of competition, that low stakes competition, I think is quite useful. Um, more high stakes competition is um, questionable, I would say, for a higher education, although uh, much more involved in the, the K-12 environment. Um, and the last one there is the idea of encouraging teamwork. Uh, that's actually a very useful one um, and one that uh, I'm not sure how applicable it is, because I'll be honest with you, you know, I've never gone to law school, um, so I'm not as familiar with how you've structured your classes and the nature of assignments that you've got in there. Um, but um, if that is a useful quality, which I suspect it probably is, um, you know, that's one that, that you could use. Um, Two resources that uh, I found along the way that I looked at how to gamify, uh, I've just dropped links to in the chat um, that I think are, you know, I think one of them has like 14 or 12 ways. The other one is 15. So those are kind of uh, ones that you can have. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll talk about is um, some strategies that you guys can use uh, on your own. Uh, so one that 
I like that I think is very applicable in higher ed is using Easter eggs. Um, does anyone know what an Easter egg is when it comes to gaming? I see a couple of nods and I see some blank stares. So an Easter egg is, go ahead, Rena. I see you come off mute. This is thanks to Patty inserting questions, I believe, into um, a game or a video. It's basically just hidden things. Okay. So hidden things are unexpected things. Uh, so, you know, knowing that the third block on the second level, when you hit it, turns into a mushroom that makes you bigger, even though there's no indication on the screen that it's a, you know, that it's there. That's an Easter egg. Um, there are things designed in the game to make it easier for you or make uh, your task easier, but you have to sort of, you know, look for them or know that they're there. Um, one of my favorite things to do is syllabus Easter eggs. Um, and so I don't know who, I don't know if Samuel Levine is still one of your faculty members, but when you Google Toro Law Syllabi, that's the first image that comes up. Um, so either people look at his syllabus a lot, which is a great thing because, um, you know, I, I have trouble getting my students to look at mine once, um, let alone, you know, enough times that it's the first thing that comes up when you type Toro Law Syllabi. Um, in the thing. But one of the things I often use is, is syllabi um, Easter eggs. So I'll insert things throughout my syllabi. Um, one of the ways in which I've seen do it is I've seen folks that will um, basically put a word or two randomly inserted throughout the document, oftentimes just uh, a word sort of just with some kind of punctuation on either side. So the student sort of knows that like this isn't kind of common and they'll stick it like in the middle of sentences and, and at the end of sentences. And if you were to take all of the things that um, are in between those two pieces of punctuation throughout the six or eight pages, they'll form a set of instructions uh, that um, the asks the students to do something so you can tell the students that actually read through the entire thing because they got the entire set of instructions and then um, they do whatever it is you ask them to do. Um, you can attach points to this or not. Um, you could just use it as a, you know, a, an activity to see how many students actually do it. Um, one that I know uh, one of my own faculty do is they have this, um, basically this full section and it's in the it's about two thirds of the way through all of the institutional policies. So like the plagiarism policy and the attendance policy and, you know, the like all of the things the university and the system require us to put in, uh, you know, that usually make up the last, I don't know, six, eight, 10, 20 pages of our syllabi. So about two thirds of the way through using the exact same font and the exact same header, you know, construction. So in this case, bolded, italicized, they just stick this, this sentence in there. And, um, you know, so they basically give up, uh, you know, points for folks who actually, you know, find that, notice it and, um, you know, send it off. And, and the more people that do it, um, the more points um, uh, folks get. Um, so that way, you know, it's encouraging folks to, to find it. Um, I've often seen ones like this where they will um, go the opposite way. So this one actually says, you know, not to tell other people and that the fewer people that do it, the more points you get. Um, the other way I've often seen it done it is the opposite. They'll still tell you not to tell other people. Um, and they might include a line in there about, you know, academic honesty and, and, you know, dispositions and that kind of thing that, you know, which I'm sure, you know, one of the dispositions of being a, a lawyer that your professional association says has something about honesty in there. Um, you know, so including a line about that and saying, you know, like, don't tell other people about this, but the more people that do it, the higher, you know, the more points I'm going to give on this. Um, you know, and so that's a, a common way that, you know, uh, I find a lot of instructors will use Easter eggs in their uh, syllabi. You can do it with really any sort of thing. So if you've got a really complicated assignment that you get a lot of questions about, um, oftentimes year after year, 
uh, readings that you think are more dry that you have the ability to go in and manipulate. So obviously if it's a textbook, you can't do that with, but if it's an online reading, it's easy enough to do. Um, if you've got videos that you uh, use in your class that you expect students to do outside of class time and watch, um, you know, adding something into those because it's easy enough to to grab a video off of, uh, you know, YouTube or Vimeo or wherever, you know, do a screen capture of it in um, Uja and then, you know, 27 minutes into it, you can just pop up and, you know, have a little note to the students for 10 seconds that say, like, if you've made it this far, you know, and, and then do this kind of thing, you know, email me or go into the discussion forum and post something or other, um, you know, and, and I like doing the discussion form one because once students see some activity starting to happen in the discussion form, they assume that, oh, I'm supposed to do something in there, but they don't know where they have to find it. So it forces them to go back and start looking through the materials for that week to find what it is that they were supposed to do in the discussion form. Um, so Easter eggs are a common game strategy that you see employed throughout. Um, gating the content. Um, and I don't know how many of us do this. I do it in all of my classes. Uh, so each of my classes are set up where the content online is, uh, there are three pieces to it. So there's a uh, an introduction section, there's a content section, and then there's a um, an assessment section at the end. And um, they get the introduction, which is usually a couple of sentences that, you know, tells them this is what we're going to be up to this week um, and then gives them the learning objectives in you know student friendly language. Then when they hit the content page, basically I give them access to the readings and then I make them do a, a, a quiz that I've got set up in the the canvas that isn't counted towards a grade, but they've got to score at least 80% on in order to unlock the rest of the content. Um, and it's really easy to do because all you've got to have it set up is when you set up your modules in um, Canvas, you've just got to set it so that there's a prerequisite set and that the prerequisite is that they need to complete all of the items in there. So that means that they can't move on to the session three content until they finish the session two content and so on. And then you can gate the rest of it by basically creating a requirement when you click on the, actually I'll go back, when you click on those three dots that are over here by the, um, let me see if I can find, annotate. When you click on those three dots that are over there by the um, the module title, what you will get is it will take you to um, turn this off again now. Your module settings, and you can set up requirements. So in my case, they've got to look at the main page. They've got to look at the introductory page. They've got to look at the content page. They've got to look at the question or checklist page. And then they've got to score an 80 on the quiz in order to unlock all of the rest of the content that's in the course. And the quiz is set up in such a way that they can take it as many times as they want. Uh, so they can continue to take it until they get that 80%. Um, and it's eight out of 10 because there's only 10 questions there. And the quiz is basically directly based on the readings. So I know that they've learned at least the specific things that I want them to get out of the readings because they've gone and passed the quiz. And typically speaking, what I'll do with these is um, my quiz bank usually has about 20% more questions than what I'm delivering. So in this case, if there was 10 questions, it would have 12 questions in there. So it'll pick just 10 questions at random. It'll also randomize the order of the questions as they present, as well as the order of the possible responses A to D. Uh, so that you can't just remember that, you know, I got, like I chose item A for question one and item B for question two, and I'm confident about those two, but question three I was, because it'll change each of the times. Um, you know, and that's, a, a, again, another common way. That's based upon the idea of this notion of having to complete a task in order to get to the next level. Um, another one that I often use actually in my, um, in my professional development sessions, my faculty development sessions like this is some kind of quiz tool like uh, Cahoots or Padlet or those types of ones. And you'd be amazed at how many people actually, you know, regardless of your age that, um, you know, buy into this notion. So um, if you haven't used one of these before, basically it's just an online quiz based tool. 
And uh, what will happen is at the beginning, um, you will be given a, a code that you can punch into your phone um, or punch into your computer that will get you to my particular Kahoot or my particular um, uh, quiz-based tool that I'm using. And the this here is a, a timer that counts down. So, um, and it counts down based on points. So the quicker you solve it, the more points that you get. Um, and basically, um, you know, as you punch in, there's gonna be four answers here. Now, obviously uh, this example doesn't have answers that correspond with what that particular thing is, but you would pick one of these four things. And as you're finishing that, um, after each question, you'll get this leaderboard displayed. And depending upon how many points you got, depending upon how quickly you did the question, oops, I guess I should open up my whiteboard and remove all my marks, shouldn't I? Uh, oops, I hit the wrong thing there. What do you wanna do? There we go. Um, so it'll give you a leaderboard that'll go through and, and tell you how you're doing. You know, so if you're thinking about review for uh, an exam, since you're in the middle of exams right now, um, you know, having students either in a formal way or an informal way uh, doing these kinds of things. And, you know, this is something that you don't have to be in person to do. This is something that can be done online. This is something that you can ask your students to do. This is something you can require them to do in small groups. And at the end of the game, just to send you a screenshot so you can see all of the people that participated and making sure that everyone has participated in their group's particular cahoots. So you can use it as a way to help organize their own study groups around these kinds of things. Um, you know, it's sort of a very basic uh, way to go about this. And then, um, you know, the other sort of easy way to do it in Canvas is to actually use the badges as a way of um, having things set up for demonstrating knowledge. And uh, I always use these as sort of my base example because um, I'm willing to bet that most of us here have one or more of these. Uh, and if you don't, um, actually, I can quickly go and grab the course that they're from. Um, but it's the Department of Online Ed has a course on using uh, Zoom and Yuja as well as Canvas uh, that you can subscribe to. Um, I'll grab it in a second there. And um, basically you can go in and, and self-enroll, sorry, into the course. So you don't need to be invited or to um, actually have to contact anyone. You can just go to the link. I'm going to drop in a couple of seconds here. And we're familiar with these, Michael. We Okay, we're perfect. Familiar. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I see these all the time throughout the system. Like folks will put them in their, um, you know, in their email signatures. I see them on their LinkedIn profiles. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, so there's the enrollment link and it's a, a common way of doing it. I can, uh, I'm looking at the time and seeing I've got about 15 minutes left. So if you like, I can go through and show how to do badges, but, um, and how to set them up in your, your class, but, uh, I'll defer that until, well, if we don't get any questions, uh, the last thing that I wanted to share with you, uh, there's a, a good resource that, um, uh, I like, it's not too dated, um, published about three years ago. Um, sorry, this one's published about six years ago. No. Uh, the other one I was planning on dropping in. Uh, I like this one because it does a pretty good job at um, providing a literature review of what was available at the time. And I just dropped the link uh, with the DOI for it in the chat. Um, but it goes through and talks about sort of, you know, what we actually know from the empirical research. So those questions, and I can't remember, I think it might have been you, Rena, or, or Anne had about, you know, does it actually have a meaningful impact upon student outcomes? Um, you know, what is the effect that it has on student engagement? Um, those are the types of questions that you see uh, being answered in this particular one. And, and like I say, while it is a little dated, um, I think it was probably one of the better, more comprehensive literature reviews uh, that I've seen on the topic, uh, both prior to this and since this. So it's the reason why I keep using it. Um, and with that, I will 
uh, pause for questions and I'll stop sharing my screen and um, see if there's things I can talk about through specifically or um, like I say, I can also go through and show you how to specifically set up badges in Canvas as well if that's of interest, but I want to go where you guys are want to query about. <clears throat> 